thank you. It's certainly a pleasure to be here again after all this time. And uh, I'm here mainly because this is something that I really believe in. We've uh, used EMUR for wound care for some time now. In fact, it started about 45 years ago, uh, initially on the, on the gunshot wound that had a large tunnel that was about six inches long, and the wound was about uh, three to four inches wide. Normally, this would have required a uh, uh, skin graft and we required uh, long-term care. But in essence, the tunnel closed in about a week and, and, that, and the whole wound healed in about five weeks. That was with emu oil by itself. So then we learned the ability of emu oil to transport a biologically active compounds. And that was the beginning of everything. Once we found that we had something that we could actually treat the wound from the outside in, that we could actually transport all the substances that we wanted uh, from the outside without sending it through the body. We must recognize that once there's a wound, the body will make all the attempts in the world to isolate it, to seal it off so that infection cannot invade the body. So it, be it behooves us then to be able to treat that wound from the outside. And that's basically what we've done here. Okay, we're going to call this wound tech uh, mainly with the use of fatty acids to treat uh, chronic wound. We're able to use all the essential nutrients that the body needs and transport these nutrients from the outside in. And in essence, we are feeding the wound uh, from the outside. If we're going to use antibiotics, we can use antibiotics like genomycin, uh, something that's usually quite toxic to the kidney if you're going to use it for a long period of time. But in essence, we can give the same compound, the same antibiotic, at concentration 40 to 50 times the concentration you would get if you gave it IV. And meanwhile, use one dose per month. And that is to use one pint per month. 80 mil what we use would be uh, 80 milligrams of genomycin per pint. And that's equivalent to one small dosage of genomycin if you get one uh, time every eight hours. But we're able to get 40 to 50 times the maximum concentration you would give if you gave it IV over a continuous period of time at the level of the wound without passing this through the kidney or the liver in any toxic amount. Uh, in this, we use the wet pack technique where the wound is packed with antibiotic contained solution and this solution, of course, again, is going to be 40 to 60 times greater than that you would give if you gave the maximum dose IV. A do genomycin dose can be anywhere from 80 to 140 milligrams IV every 8 to 12 hours. But we take one dose, put in one pint of solution, and use wet pack to pack the wound every other day or maybe every third day. And we get these kinds of concentration and we don't have to worry about uh, tox toxicity to the kidney. We don't have to worry about resistance. One thing that came up, we get very upset when nurses culture wounds. Wounds are, are inherently contaminated. They got all kinds of bacteria growing in them. You culture these bacteria, then you got to deal with it. You got to do something about it. Well, these wounds are just there doing nothing. They're what we call colonized. They're there just because they got to be somewhere. They're not causing any problem whatsoever. But the problem is that these bacteria stay around for long, long periods of time. You've treated that patient with antibiotics over a period of time. Uh, meanwhile, the bacteria, bacteria will be constantly acquiring resistance constantly requiring resistance. Well, that's no problem either until, until conditions change to the point that they become, they become uh, pathogens. Like if you change the environment of these bacteria, uh, the same bacteria that were just there resting can infect and become pathogens. Then you got a big problem on your, problem on your hand. You got a bacteria now that's resistant to everything you've tried over the, over the years that you've had this wound. It's acquired resistance, but now the condition changed. Either the proteinaceous uh, 
nature of the surrounding or the uh, glucose or what have you, something changes and this same bacteria invades. It makes more sense to me to knock all of those, wound, those bacteria out and prevent, the, prevent them from invading. Although you heard of MRSA, the staph infection that people get, well, if you got a wound that's staph infected and you treat with a solution containing antibiotics like genomycin that you can transport right through the wound, then you can render that wound sterile in about three days rather than about six weeks to six months. Sometimes it takes about six months to render a wound sterile when you're talking about staph. Now see, this MRSA is a staph that's become resistant to uh, the penicillin-type compound, mainly methicillin. And once you do that, you got some problems on your hand unless you can rid the body of it right away. In fact, legally, you got to treat this wound and treat it and treat it and treat it and treat it until that wound is sterile. MRSA is so uh, contagious as far as being able to spread from patient to patient throughout the institution that uh, you just like to get rid of it as rapidly as you can. Thanks. The type of wounds that we're dealing with uh, the diabetic complicated wound, mainly a neuropathic wound. Now, the importance of the diabetic neuropathic wound is that uh, diabetics typically do not have lots of feeling in the feet. And what that means that is that if you were to press your hand against this for a period of time, well, let's say your, your, your toe, your toes will automatically move when they got uncomfortable. But with diabetes, your toe may stay right there to where there's a hole in, in it, in the toe, or to an ulcerform without the body knowing it. See, with the nerve being damaged, the nerves will not tell your toes to move. And that way, that can be the beginning of the diabetic wound. You may have enough blood to keep the, wound al keep the, keep the toe alive without any problem until you create this ulcer. And this type of ulcer tend not to have a lot of feelings. In fact, when we treat these wounds, many times we debride the wounds, cut away the dead, devitalized material without even deadening the wound. And that's because uh, this, these diabetic complications have already occurred. But as we treat the wound, somehow the nerves start to recover. And as we get toward the end of the recovery, the patient will start to feel the wound. The next type of wound will be a traumatic wound that may be long-term and slow healing. Next site would be the burn. With burn wounds, treating it with uh, the emu oil uh, solution, you tend to get uh, less scarring, less pain, and they say that this is even better than using cadaver skin as a covering. The bed sore and pressure sore. Well, typically, the bed sore, you still got a problem with circulation in that you got bone pressing on blood supply to a given tissue and the tissue is dying. So with the pressure ulcer in the bed, so basically you got a problem with the blood, uh, with the wound not healing because of the tissue being, and the skin being very close to the skin and bone pressing on the skin to cause the death. The next thing that we fear so much is the amputation. Uh, Many times when doctors see uh, gangrene, the first thing we always say is that we got to amputate, especially if the bone is infected and, uh, and the patient got osteomyelitis. People tend not to go in, want to go any further if the bone is infected with osteomyelitis. These type wounds tend to have muscle, bone, or tendon exposed, and they can be extremely painful if they are located places other than uh, on the feet uh, and the patient happens not to be diabetic. Okay. okay, so what we tried to do, try to provide moisture to the wound, antibiotics, vitamin, you got to provide trace elements. I talked to some of you all on yesterday about the so-called D6D. Uh, that's one of the compounds that converts one of the very active compounds in emu oil to one of the more active one called gamma-linoleic acid. To do that, you need certain trace elements like magnesium, zinc, and, and you need vitamin B6. So for that, and also you need antioxidants to keep you from getting uh, further tissue destruction. You need antibiotics. 
Antioxidants are those things that need nature, many things that may well be a natural breakdown of the tissue itself. So if you can give all these things in the womb without sending them through the body, then you're well ahead of the game. We're able to transport these essential fats by rendering water-soluble vitamins fat-soluble. We're able to transport the water-soluble vitamins into the wound as well. Normally, you cannot transport anything that's not soluble in fat through the skin. With this, the EMI oil being a component, decreased inflammation, it decreased platelet attraction, it causes rapid tissue regeneration and tissue repair, promote arterial dilatation. Oh, we have, we have a typo. Nobody saw it, right? Good. <laughs> Which increases available blood supply. Now, the importance of this is that within the EMI oil, you got two, maybe three arterial dilators. These arterial dilators uh, provide the utmost, one of the things that's very, very important to any wound care is that you increase the amount of blood that's available to the wound. You increase the blood supply, the wound will heal. Thanks. We stimulate the tissue immune response. All of this is related to the presence of the fats, the essential fats that are in the EMI oil. You decrease the likelihood of colonization and likelihood of bacteria become resistant pathogens. Again, that's related to the bacteria that are there doing nothing but absorbing small amounts of antibiotics over a period of time and become resistant. So that when the time is right, they jump all over the patient with all four feet. We have rapid tissue regeneration, remote faster healing through the rapid absorption of these very components. Wounds tend to be rendered sterile much earlier. Okay. Uh, these are, you've seen this before. This compares EMI oil with the human skin. Now I want you to pay attention to this compound, myristic acid. If you've heard of CMO, CMO was something that was initially isolated from the Swiss mouse, then it was isolated from butter fat, and then it was isolated from beef fat. And this is something that they put on the market for multiple sclerosis, for sarcoidosis. Uh, they put it on the market, it's on the market for COPD, it's supposed to cause some reduction in the damage to the lung, and fibromyalgia. The other important compound here that you would note is linoleic acid. Now this compound requires D6D. That's an enzyme that becomes deficient in all these conditions that we, make, we mentioned. Without the, this condition, without this enzyme, people get all kinds of skin condition and all other, all other kinds of abnormalities such as arterial insufficiency, related to arterial sclerosis, abnormal cholesterol, and so forth. This is one of these central amino acids, I mean fatty acids, that the body cannot make. This compound converts to, uh, to gamma linoleic acid, which is necessary for the prevention and the control of eczema. That's the basis of, this, of being able to control eczema using EMI oil, and that you bypass the need for that enzyme. If the patient doesn't have the enzyme to break this down, then you must bypass it. Okay. Okay, the basic protocol with cleaning wounds with soap and water, use aseptic techniques to pack the wound with the uh, antibiotics, EMI oil solution. We use occlusive dressing. Without this occlusive dressing, please a piece of saran wrap to prevent back diffusion of the solution back through the wound out through the dressing. We uh, use a piece of saran wrap after our final dressing. Uh, the dressing is changed by three times a week. By having an appropriate solution, it's not necessary to change it every day. You're going to remove tissue every time you remove that dressing. We should measure the wound diameter and depth on a regular basis. Okay. The components of the studies, uh, these were chronic non-healing wounds. They were of the extremities. And all of those of the feet were scheduled for amputation. And all of these patients had osteomyelitis, which meant that the bones were infected. 
the importance of this, now we tend to think of a bone as being something solid. The bone is not solid, it's very porous, and it's got circulation. So we can treat bone infection on the outside in as well. Something that's never really been tried before. We achieve 100% healing rate as you see in the following studies. This patient was a 42-year-old Afro-American patient with type 1 diabetes, developed gangrene of the right great toe uh, after stepping on the nail. This patient went all day, got ready to take his shoe off, and he had to use a pair of pliers to take his shoe off because it was all the way through his foot into the, foot, into the bone. After presenting to the hospital about a week later, Amputation recommended after discovering that there was osteomyelitis. Okay. This is the wound uh, prior to uh, the debridement. This is bone exposure. Okay. This is the final wound. That took that took about five weeks. But you save this person from an amputation, okay? The next case was 29-year-old male that got hurt about uh, nine years earlier in an automobile accident. Uh, this also was on the lateral aspect of the ankle. It had been skin grafted three times, it not healed, and again, osteomyelitis was there. Now, once you think of, again, any wound that's very slow to heal like that, Almost every case will have a bone infection, osteomyelitis. This is where we started. And this was after about uh, seven weeks. This Here you can see where the skin graft had taken place, had been rejected and so forth. But this one had been waxing and waning for nine years and not healed. Okay. This is one of the late, last one after two months, but the wound did heal completely. We don't have the final one, okay? This was a 96-year-old male that was in the nursing home. Uh, they had been treating this wound with normal saline genomycin solution for two years. It did not heal. The bone was constantly exposed, okay? This is where we started. This is bone. They've been treated with normal saline and genomycin. Now, genomycin is water soluble. So what they were doing was not absorbed into the wound anyway. This was after two weeks. So in essence, you got what was a stage four, which is all the way to the bone, to a stage two in a two week period of time. You got this regrowth over the bone, okay? Now I would like to say the patient healed, but Tarnate hit the nursing home, he was transferred, and he died about a week later. You know about the bad Tarnate we had in Tennessee, don't you? Well, I'll tell you about it. Anyway, this was a 48-year-old Afro-American -Amer uh, female. In Tennessee, we have brown recluse spider bites all the time. And with the brown recluse spider bite, usually in the center there's a dead area about the size of a button and that dead area starts spreading and spreading and spreading. Meanwhile, there's a red border around it that just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. Uh, in other words, the center of that wound dies and it keeps dying because of, severe, because of very severe arterial constriction. What we're able to do is somehow give this patient an arterial dilator topically, which seems to be contained within the emu oil kill out the infection, inflammation, and lo and behold, uh, these wounds heal. In fact, if you apply this solution to the black spot of one of these brown recluse bites, that black spot will slough in about two days, and the wound will usually heal about, heal about one week later. This patient wound, unfortunately, was two years old, had not healed. This is where we started. This is uh, two weeks, uh, this is four weeks, and the next one, this was in uh, four months. I said three, the last one was three weeks, this was in uh, four weeks. This is completely here, just a little uh, incrustation, but it washed right away, okay? 
and email oil, we got at least three, maybe four arterial dilators, I think. This was 72-year-old old with a, a stasis also of the leg. You know, these wounds don't heal either. But for some reason, well, once we reestablish the circulation and use the email oil to nourish the wound from the outside in, this wound healed as well. This was the beginning, and this is the final wound. Okay. This guy, 56 year old uh, male, poorly controlled diabetic for about 20 years. This man thought that his blood sugar should be two to 300 at all times. He developed gangrene in the right toe, got ready to take his shoe off, it was full of blood. They did a bone scan, they had documented osteomyelitis. He had documented osteomyelitis, and amputation was recommended. This man weighed about 340, 350 pounds. He would not have done well with an amputation at all, okay? This was the beginning, that's a little light, but this is gang gangrenous. This whole area was black, okay? This was after it was debrided. All this, all the dead material was cut away. This was in uh, two weeks, okay. This is a final wound in six weeks. You know, he even got toe prints. The toe prints even came back. And that was, a, that was one of the best cases we've had. This guy definitely did not want an amputation. If he had amputated his foot, he would not have done well, especially with his poorly controlled diabetes and with his poor compliance, okay? This was a six-year-old male with severe diabetes. Um, he already had a left above the knee amputation. The right leg was contracted at the knee and the hip. He had multiple ulcers at the foot. No pulses could be felt below the groin. This man had documented osteomyelitis. Now we document this osteomyelitis by what we call three-phase bone scan, okay? Okay, this was the beginning wound. This is a heel. Uh, I recommended an amputation for this man too. I didn't realize how much this foot meant to him but he used his foot to pivot to get in and out of his wheelchair. So, you know, I was too quick to judge to decide that, uh, that the best for this man was to have an amputation. But after he showed up at the office, the administrator of the nursing home brought him to the office in his car, and we decided to just give it a try anyway. This was in about four weeks. This was eight weeks with complete healing. All of these were ulcers as well. Thank you. This was an 82-year-old poorly controlled diabetic that developed circulatory insufficiency, diabetic neuropathy with no feeling in the feet, and re the result was a diabetic ulcer of the great toe. Okay, this is where we started. This was the initial visit. This was the second visit. This was the third visit. The fourth visit showed complete healing. This was a 75-year-old female gangrene of the field toe. Uh, and uh, this lady had already had an amputation of the field toe by the time we got to her. She had three, a total of three wounds, one on the top of the foot and one on the bottom of the foot. All three of these wounds were no doubt communicating. She had very poorly controlled diabetes. She had arteriosclerotic heart disease in addition to diabetic neuropathy. Okay. okay, now this is the bottom of the foot. This is the top. This is where the field toe was amputated. This is, was on the top of the foot, the bottom of the foot, the top of the foot. In essence, all three of these wounds were communicating. This is where the field toe was amputated. This was two weeks before the complete healing. This is the final wound. This final wound here. Okay. 
Okay. That concludes our, our slide presentation of this. But one thing that's of utmost importance is that with email oil as a transporter, we can transport substances into the wound that normally would not uh, be able to be transported. We're able to transport uh, both the fat soluble, we have to transport the uh, so-called trace elements, we have to transport antibiotics. Recall we talked about the wound having walled off uh, itself from the body anyway. This is a method by which the body prevents things from invading. The body will create a barrier to prevent bacteria from invading, and if it's going to prevent bacteria from invading, the circulation can be impaired as well as far as blood supply getting to this wound. Uh, in fact, the, wound, the body will ultimately try to get rid of this foot or this wound in order to save the rest of the body. So it starts walling off the wound uh, with time. Uh, sometimes they do what they call auto amputation in patients to see how far it's going to die back when they have absolute dry gangrene of the foot where the whole toe, where the whole toe is dead. They let it die back to see how much circulation they got so they know what level they have to amputate. Well, that's an indication, too, of how the body walls off the invaders, okay? The other thing that happens, too, uh, this was published last week that we talked about, uh, this problem of colonization. That's going to be something that's going to come back to haunt us more and more, I think. Uh, these bacteria that are there and just there doing nothing, the problem is that well, they may be just nourishing on what's there, but not really bothering the wound or bothering the body at all. But the problem is that they're there absorbing small amounts of the antibiotics over a period of time, and they develop more and more resistance to everything that you've used over the years. And still, that becomes no problem until condition change, change, conditions change to the point that they can invade the body. And once they invade the body, you have a pathogen now that you have a whole lot of difficulty in dealing with in that the bacteria now uh, will not be touched by any antibiotics that you use. And this would be that chronic infection that would probably go on and invade your bone and keep going on and on and on and on. So we, I think that it's very important that if you can, uh, try to render this wound sterile immediately the wound, when we use genomycin, we talked about the concentration of being about 40 to 50 times the concentration you get IV. Now, if you think of something, a bacteria being resistant, say to penicillin, there are only three bacteria known to be resistant to penicillin. That's uh, Rocky Mountain spider fever, one that causes Rocky Mountain spider fever, one that causes Legionnaire's disease, and one that causes uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. The reason that they're resistant to penicillin is that they do not have cell walls. All other bacteria would be sensitive to penicillin. It may be enough to kill the host, but it will kill it. You may kill the patient, but it will, you can kill the bacteria. Now, what that says is that, it's this, that with that dose of genomycin, it is so high that it will kill any bacteria. Any bacteria that has previously said, uh, been said to be resistant to genomycin. Well, when he says it's resistant to genomycin, any antibiotics is resistant to the concentration on the culture plate that you grow the bacteria out to determine whether it's sensitive or not. But once you increase the concentration to the extent that we're able to increase it by transporting the genomycin with the email oil right into the wound, you're able to get these high concentrations so high that resistance will not become a problem. There's no bacteria known to be resistant to genomycin at 40 to 50 micrograms a milliliter, which we are able to get in our solution uh, at the level of the wound. We get uh, slow absorption into the wound, slow absorption into the bone, and the amount of toxicity that you're going to get to the liver or the kidney is going to be very low. But you're able to, to knock out these so-called colonized bacteria, those that have invaded the bone, those that are giving you the problem with the constant infection and inflammation of the wound, and the wound will not heal. As I said before, almost every wound that will not heal over a long period of time would tend to have a bone infection. But now, 
we can safely get these high concentration antibodies right through the tissue, right into the bone, and kill out whatever we got. Thank you. I've got five more minutes. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Well, the, the, the rule is that FDA doesn't approve or disapprove any kind of natural product, you know, that's, that's uh, deemed non-toxic to, to human. In essence, this is as, as a herbal. The only problem is that once you add to genomycin, a physician can add it. But otherwise, as long as you're not adding anything that's prescription, you can use it. Okay. What does the American Medical Association say about this? Have they approved your using it this way? Or? Well, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they, they would, uh, but, you know, they don't really involve themselves in anything like this. They will allow you to use any kind of herbal preparation that you want to. Uh, and if you want to add genomycin to your solution, it's okay. You know, they give you that leeway to do it. But it's no, they don't really approve or disapprove anything that you do like this. There are several around Jackson that are looking at it now, and there are going to be a lot more because I've uh, taken these photographs to, all the, the, to uh, several of the surgeons that uh, were supposed to amputate these patients. They could not believe the results. Yes, they can. They can. They can do it. Uh, in fact, uh, your, your physician that's treating this chronic wound would uh, would provide genomycin for you. There's nothing else that he can do for this patient, so he'd be more than willing. You notice that all these patients were supposed to have been amputated, so we were out. We were at uh, wit's end with it. There was nothing else we could do. And, you know, the patient was willing to try something. But, you know, typically it, it costs about thirty dollars to $40,000 to amputate a patient. And the material that you would use would probably be less than $1,000. Hmm. In fact, uh, the patient came the other day with a wound that was two years old, a paraplegic. And, uh, that was a wound of the, the, the uh, bottom of the second was infected, the bone was infected, had a deep decubitus ulcer. So they brought him to me. The uh, workman comp people, have, uh, they've decided that they would approve this treatment, mainly because our treatment's gonna cost over $100,000. Meanwhile, you can have a patient that would not, would not have been able to sit uh, with the, you know, even in his wheelchair, because they were gonna have to remove the leg and uh, that have the pelvic as well. So that was a save, no matter what I charged them, it's been a lot less than $100,000 they would have had to pay anyway. Anyway, I'm in the process of writing these up now in that I think that at this point, uh, this is a final solution. I really don't plan, I don't think that I would have to change it anymore. Uh, the, most, the most recent change that I did uh, I take niacin because they said niacin prevents Alzheimer's disease, and that's one thing I don't want, it lowers your cholesterol, things like that. But when I took niacin, about 2.30 in the morning, I turned red the next day and flushed at about uh, 2 o'clock in the, in the day. I said, oh, this is great, this is really great. But what that told me was that that was dilating all my vessels at, at, at the outside, at the periphery. It was dilating all my blood vessels, so once I worked with it, made it fat soluble, incorporated it into the wound, what normally would have taken six weeks to heal happened in two weeks. See, if you can increase the blood supply to a wound, you're going to trip the rate of wound healing anyway, and that's what the, the niacin did. I didn't like the flushing and the itching, but lo and behold, by incorporating it into our wound solution, made all the difference in the world. Uh, what we're basically providing the, in the email, or we're, we're providing essential fatty acids. Uh, someone asked me once, why don't we use uh, proteins and carbohydrates in a wound solution? Well, you could use proteins, but the environment is very proteinaceous anyway in the wound. The wound's secreting all kind of protein-like material, 
carbohydrate like material polysaccharide, it's got all those things that it can utilize if you give it the uh, nutrients that it needs to utilize that. But basically, the missing link is going to be the essential fatty acids that you're providing and that you're feeding the wound with. Uh, I like the concept that the emu, oil is, the emu is storing all of his uh, important nutrients, especially those that are fat-soluble, within his fat, and that's what you're uh, adding to the wound. The Aborigines used just plain fat and just plain skin to cover their wounds with, and they got excellent results. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Dr.